If you've been following the channel chat, you'll have noticed many atheists making pathetic comments and a few making valuable, well-thought-out comments which are much appreciated. But recently the atheists have faded away into the background. I think this probably has something to do with the growing realisation that much of science has wandered off into the wilderness and now obviously merits the title Science Falsely So Called. In episodes 74 and 75, we saw the Institute of Art and Ideas arranging for top scientists to talk about some of these problems. In episode 62, we got a glimpse of the current dilemma for evolution. And in episode 84, we saw the pathetic state of cosmology. This shouldn't come as a surprise. In the first two episodes, we saw how real science began. Francis Bacon proposed the scientific method in his groundbreaking book, A New Method of Science. He pointed out that the old proto-science from the Greeks onwards was based on reasoning about apparently plausible ideas. Bacon pointed out that human reasoning is very unreliable, saying, Nature carries the stamp of the Creator, whereas Ban's reason carries the stamp of his own folly. Bacon's method demanded detailed and thorough observation and measurement of the real world. Such comprehensive observation and measurement that it would allow inductive reasoning to deduce hypotheses about the underlying causes for patterns in their measurements. After devising a hypothesis, it must be tested against new observations and measurements. And if these observations don't confirm the hypothesis, it must be rejected and a new one sought. One which explains both the old and the new measurements. Following Bacon's procedure obviously needs a very great deal of time. Newton, for example, considered observations and measurements taken over more than a century. Galileo's experiments on various kinds of pendulums and balls of various sizes and masses rolling down slopes of various inclinations. Brahe's observations of the heavenly bodies and Kepler's deductions based on them. Halley's observations of comet behaviour, the observed trajectories of cannonballs, and a host of other things in order to deduce his laws of motion. But as we saw in episodes 3 to 6, status-seeking atheists began to muscle their way to control of science through the power of large supplies of money. By the middle of the last century, they'd gained almost complete control. Bacon's science was based on the proposition nature carries the stamp of the creator. The goal of science is to find out how the creator's creation works, or, as Kepler put it, to think God's thoughts after him. How the creator created his creation is not open to observation or measurement. It was finished long ago. Creation is outside the realm of science. All we can know for sure is in the brief account in the Bible. Atheists can't accept this. Since they refuse to accept a creator, they have to believe the creation created itself. There's no other alternative. And to maintain credibility, the atheist scientists must explain how it created itself. But all their hypotheses are falling to pieces. Not surprising if the creation did not create itself. To carry on with their story, in spite of all the observations and measurements, the scientific method had to be belittled, discredited and abandoned. One of the best-known scientists on the scene today is Sabina Hossenfelder. Even she appears to be concerned about how science has gone off the rails. Let's join her in looking at some of her concerns. The pattern is this. 
Particle physicists invent particles, make predictions for those invented particles, and when these predictions are falsified, they change the model and make new predictions. They say it's good science because these hypotheses are falsifiable. I'm afraid most of them believe this. But just because a hypothesis is falsifiable doesn't mean it's good science. And no, Popper didn't say that a hypothesis which is falsifiable is also scientific. He said that a hypothesis which is scientific is also falsifiable. In case you're a particle physicist, here's a diagram that should help. Example, tomorrow you'll receive $1,000 from my friend the Prince of Nigeria. Falsifiable, but not scientific. The best way to see that what particle physicists are doing isn't good science is by noting that it's not working. Good scientists should learn from their failures, but particle physicists have been making the same mistake for 50 years. Let's imagine that this curve is the standard model and this is all the existing data. And imagine we have a particle physicist, let's call him Bob. Bob says, that's nice, but we haven't checked the model over here. And he says, I could make this model more complicated so that the curve goes instead this way or that way or any other way. I'll pick this one, call this my prediction, and hey, I'll publish it in PRL. Why do I predict it? Because I can. Because you see, my model agrees with all the data. So this prediction could be correct, right? Right? And it's falsifiable. Therefore, I'm a good scientist. And all of Bob's friends with all their different predictions say the same. They are all good scientists, every single one of them. And as a result of all that good science, we get any possible prediction. Then they do an experiment and the data come in and would you know it, they agree with the standard model. And Bob and all his friends say, oh well, no worries, we'll update our prediction. Now the deviations are in this range where we still haven't measured it. We need bigger experiments. And also, I'll write a new paper about it. What's the problem with that procedure? The problem is that those models with all their different predictions are unnecessarily complicated. They should never have been put forward. They are not scientific hypotheses. They are made up stories like my friend, the Prince of Nigeria, who will send you money tomorrow. Though if you send me $100 today, I'll have another word with him. And that's what's going wrong in particle physics. They have no justification for making the standard model more complicated. When they do it nevertheless, it isn't working. Because that's just not how science works. If you change a good model, then that change should be an improvement. There are a few real problems in the foundations of physics. But they are difficult to solve, and particle physicists don't seem to like working on them. She's dead right that the particle physicists are not doing science. They're not making hypotheses to explain patterns in observations. They're simply dreaming up mythematical models whose only justification is enabling them to publish stacks of papers. The scientific establishment demands that a scientist must publish a minimum number of papers every year. That doesn't allow for genuinely significant experiments. Sabina Hossenfelder pointed out there are some real problems in science that need researching. But nobody wants to look at them. It would mean a great deal of observation and measurement and serious inductive reasoning. That wouldn't allow anything like the required numbers of papers every year. And this has been going on for a long time. In 1987, three astronomers, Denison, Fiedler and Johnson, published a paper in Nature, the top journal of science. It was about a quasar they'd observed in their radio telescope for about two weeks. They'd seen it fade away and then gradually come back again. They explained this as a compact cloud of minute particles drifting across their line of sight. Gerrit Elfeskier reviewed their article in Astronomy. The most intriguing thing about the hypothesized structures, a point the report hesitated to emphasize 
but did allude to is that these objects are not stable. If such an object could exist for even a moment, it would quickly dissipate. The astronomers knew that, and so did the reviewers, but they just glossed over it. These little clouds of particles could not exist for even a moment, and yet they're telling us they can explain observations which lasted about two weeks. They all knew this paper was utter nonsense. So did Fiskier point out this was a fraud, which should never have been allowed in the top journal of science? He continued, They could either attempt to explain the radio brightness change and ignore the stability problem, or they could confront the stability issue and be unable to explain the radio variations. And, of course, that would mean they would have no paper to publish, and that's all that really matters. Their status depends on the number of papers they publish. Whether they have any value or not is irrelevant. So does Fuschir expose this as a travesty of science? Like all good scientists, they are able to tolerate the ambiguities in their model. It's just business as usual. These three are just doing what all the other good scientists are doing, writing lots of papers. Remember the strings we looked at in episode 68, one-dimensional mathematical inventions with no breadth or thickness, so no volume and no reality. Daydreams in anything from 9 to 26 dimensions, fantasies with not one single observation pointing their existence, perfect grounds for hundreds of worthless PhDs and thousands of valueless papers published over more than half a century. And there's the Oort cloud, which is supposed to explain away the fact that we still have short-period comets, even though they can't last more than 10,000 years. Carl Sagan was a great supporter of vast ages of time, and therefore a great supporter of the Oort cloud. He wrote a book, Comet, in which he noted, Many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its origin, its properties, its evolution. Yet there is not a shred of observational evidence for its existence. Another wonderful opportunity for hundreds of worthless PhDs and thousands of valueless papers, mathematical speculations based on not one shred of evidence. And things have now reached a point where I think many people would be amazed at what scientists are writing papers about. Well, if there's a little bit of consciousness in electrons and atoms, then the fact it emerges in human brains is just a difference of degree, not of kind. Well, I think that argument's all right as far as it goes, but I'm rather interested in what happens if we take it further. Uh, instead of stopping at human brains, uh, carry on into the universe and I myself have been thinking for quite a while about the question, is the sun conscious? Can the sun be conscious? Does consciousness have to be confined to brains? The cerebrocentric view of consciousness we're very used to. But traditional peoples have always taken it for granted that consciousness is much more extensive. Plato called the stars and the planets the visible gods because he thought they had intelligence. They were the bodies of which they had intelligence as well. And um, I published a paper last year in the Journal of Consciousness Studies called Is the Sun Conscious? Um, in which I argue that the interface between the sun's activity and consciousness is its electromagnetic field. This may sound strange, but sitting right next to me in the form of John Joe McFadden is one of the principal exponents of the electromagnetic field of consciousness. I think it's, you can make a perfectly coherent case that the sun has a conscious interface, a, a consciousness interfacing with its body through the electromagnetic field within and beyond the sun throughout the solar system. And if the sun's conscious, what about other stars? And if they're conscious, what about entire galaxies which may have galactic minds vastly greater than those of stars, which are like cells in the body of the galaxy. 
If electrons have consciousness, just imagine the consciousness of the sun. And what a galaxy might be thinking about. And what grounds are there for proposing such things? Well, the ancient Greeks thought the sun and planets were gods. Could any reason be more sound and scientific than that? The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Well, I think that looking down on the scientists of today, he would regretfully say, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And I don't think he would be impressed by their proud and godless claims. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.